like to introduce and welcome everyone to our community town hall for our Sandpiper and Redwood Shores Elementary School communities. Uh, my name is Carrie Emsler. I am the principal at Redwood Shores Elementary. This will be my third year, uh, and it is a true pleasure and uh, honor to work amongst all of you. And um, I do want to give a welcome to all of our community members. We have over 300 joining now and more will be coming. Uh, and a specific shout out to all of our families, parents, guardians, um, and those that take care of our little ones in our community. Um, and a, a welcome to our colleagues, the staff members um, that have taken time out of their evenings to join us tonight as well. So thank you, uh, staff and colleagues. And um, I do want to keep this brief and uh, just say thank you. Thank you all for coming. And we hope to share information with you that will give you some more uh, clarity on the next um, few weeks. So uh, I want to pass things over to Miss Gloria Higgins, the new principal at Sandpiper, so she can introduce herself as well. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Carrie. And thank you for that nice welcome to everyone. I echo. Carrie's words. I'm Gloria Higgins. I am the principal at Sandpiper Elementary School. So I'm in my first year with Belmont Redwood Shores, but in my 20th year in education. And it's been a real pleasure to join the community and to get to know you. Um, thank you very much for your interest and your attendance tonight. I also wanted to introduce Nick Walker, who is joining us and he's waving to you there. He's joining the Sandpiper and the Belmont Redwood Shores community as the AP at Nesbitt and Sandpiper, and we're really thrilled to have him on the team as well. And with that, um, I also just want to introduce the other panelists tonight. We have joining us Dan DeGuara, our superintendent, Ching-Pei Hu, our, um, our, our, excuse me, our superintendent of Ed Services, Rui Bao, our chief business official, Lara Goldman, our director of special education, and also we have Pam Hopkins, who is our administrative assistant to the superintendent, and Jerome is joining us as our tech support. So thank you very much, Jerome. And Dan, I'll turn it over to you. You're on mute, Dan. There we go. Uh, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good evening and welcome, uh, Sam Piper and Redwood Shores families. I'm so glad that you're able to join us tonight. Um, my name is Dan DeGuar, and I'm really honored to be serving as your new superintendent. Um, in the perfect world, we'd be meeting in person. However, these are extraordinary times. As we begin tonight, I want to share that we are recording the town hall and we will post it on the website so those who weren't able to join us will still have access to the information. We will begin the school year with a 100% full distance learning model with the goal of transitioning to a hybrid model uh, when all established guidelines and protocols are in place and it's safe to do so. Uh, we remain committed to a successful 2020-21 school year. And tonight I'd like to recognize um, our trustees that are joining us, uh, three of which are parents uh, in, the, in the session today. Uh, trustees Bopale, Leinbach, Ku, and Posse, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, tonight we will split our time roughly in half. The first half is a presentation about uh, some safety protocols that we'll be putting into place. Uh, the second half is directly related to the instructional models that we'll be following. Uh, following the presentations, we'll entertain question and answer. We'll do our absolute best to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, questions can be sent uh, to Pam, who will serve as our moderator. Uh, you should be able to do that in the chat feature. Uh, we'll do our best, like I said, to get to all the questions. And as we see reoccurring themes, we'll make sure that we're communicating uh, to our community with regards to those questions. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's jump right into it. Uh, I'd like to pass uh, the baton to Assistant Superintendent uh, Ching Pei Hu. Good evening. Actually, uh, Rui is going to start. <laughs> um, go ahead, Rui. You're muted, Rui. Sorry, can everyone hear me now? Okay, perfect, sorry about that. 
Um, so hello everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. Thank you for making the time. Um, so tonight we wanted to go over some of our planning uh, for our reopening model um, and our plans for the the school this for schools this year. Um, for those of you who were at the July 23rd board meeting, a lot of this will sound familiar. Um, we wanted to just provide another forum to uh, go over this information, but more importantly, as Dan mentioned, make time for school specific components um, and Q and A. So um, before launching into the specifics, I wanted to introduce the guiding principles that were developed by our Board of Trustees for school reopening. Um, these principles guide us in our development of all school reopening models, whether that is hybrid or distance. And specifically, these five guiding principles are to prioritize safety, to ensure instructional quality, to facilitate effective and open communication, to promote consistency and to foster reciprocal accountability. I won't linger too much here uh, on the specifics of new guidelines, um, other than to say that, you know, as our understanding of this changes, um, we are constantly receiving new guidance by the CDC, the California Department of Public Health, the California Department of Education, and just know that we are consistently monitoring these updates to ensure that our protocols follow these guidelines. Um, as I mentioned, our Board of Trustees met on July 23rd uh, and to talk about what a safe return to school will look like. Um, at this meeting, the Board of Trustees adopted a dual model to include in-person instruction and remote instruction um, so long as county and state, state guidelines allow it. Uh, we are opening in full distance learning um, because San Mateo County is currently on the watch list. So on health and safety, a lot of this is really more pertinent to opening in a hybrid model, um, but I think I, we wanted the community to know that even as we're opening in distance, we are continuing to plan for what a hybrid opening will look like um, and wanted to share some of that. So the governor has released some very specific criteria um, around both opening and once opening your uh, closing. So these are statistics that we are monitoring uh, to stay up to speed on it. Uh, San Mateo County data is something that uh, we look at daily. Um, and finally, our hybrid model was developed uh, uh, with the San Mateo County pandemic recovery framework in mind. So uh, there's four pillars to the pandemic recovery framework, and that's health and hygiene, face coverings, physical distancing, and limited gatherings. And in terms of what that specifically looks like at a school, um, we are talking about stable cohorts of 12 to 15 students um, and rearranging the classroom itself to allow for that uh, physical distancing. Um, as far as cleaning goes, um, classrooms are going to be sanitized daily using an EPA approved substance. Uh, for face coverings, um, we are expecting that uh, all of our staff and students uh, will be following state and county guidelines in terms of wearing masks and maintaining six feet of distance. Um, and finally, we're working with uh, healthcare partners and the county um, on testing availability. So in terms of setting foot on our campuses, and again, this is true of both, uh, for staff coming to campus, this is true both in distance learning as well as um, in hybrid learning. Uh, we want to make sure that our campuses are safe and as such, we'll be requiring uh, temperature screens and for staff a self-certification uh, in order to limit, uh, in order to enter campus. Um, and we'll also, as we get closer to planning for hybrid, be sending out a staff survey uh, to, to understand some of these accommodations that will be needed. Um, as I've mentioned before, we are coming into, uh, we are starting the year in full distance, uh, but as we think about the shift to hybrid, there are a lot of questions on our minds, such as ensuring that there's designated entry and exit locations, um, the process for the daily symptom check, um, assigning desks and hooks and classroom uh, cubbies to ensure that distancing. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions around PPE and the orders around that. Um, so in terms of what we have done, um, as I mentioned, we are expecting that everyone will be providing their own masks um, per state and county guidelines to always have a mask, but we have also bought backup masks, uh, both adult and child size. 
Uh, for our nursing staff, we have N95s as well as gloves. Um, for our special education staff, plexiglass barriers as well as face shields with the cloth drape. Um, and then finally, we've installed plexiglass barriers in all of our front offices as well as standing hand sanitizer stands um, for outside. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our principals briefly uh, to give you an idea of what this will tactically look like at our campuses. Thank you, Rui. So I just have a couple of pictures to share with our community. Um, our strong teacher leaders, Ms. Cobb, Mr. Ms. Baldonado, and Mr. Kruger helped us. And we arranged a couple of classrooms looking at social distancing. Uh, on the right, one can see uh, we have a A group for, for tape desks for our A students and desks for our B students looking at a hybrid. And then on the left, we have just um, enough desks for for a class, a hybrid, in the hybrid model. So that just kind of gives you an idea of um, what we're thinking and what we're planning regarding how to arrange the classrooms to maintain that social distancing. Uh, as well, we have about five or six different building uh, models on our campus or different uh, layouts of our buildings. So I went around and I, um, on the right, you can see a photo or uh, drawing of, um, I measured each classroom and I, uh, uh, explored and outlined how we can lay out our classroom to maintain social distancing in all of our different wings in our buildings. And then on the left, you can see an example of the exploration of how we would manage our restroom usage. Uh, we are fortunate to have quite a few restrooms on campus um, so that students, we'd have a more balanced amount of children using the different restrooms, as well as looking at how many desks we need to have in each room. Um, and what furniture we need to move around campus to ensure we have enough uh, desks and seating area for our students to maintain distancing. So those are just a couple of examples of things um, we were doing to prepare for the hybrid model. And um, there's a lot more logistics that teachers in charge and I were collaborating on as well. Thank you. Thank you. And similar to um, Redwood Shores Elementary School, we also went through our classrooms and looked at the floor plans. We have about four different layouts in our floor plans, and we were able to determine that we can fit 12 to 15 desks six feet apart with a nice area for teachers to be teaching from as well. You see on the left just a picture of what one of the classrooms would look like. That's an upper grade classroom, and you can see the single desk there. So um, students would on an A day be using that desk and on a B day, a different set of students would be using that desk, but there will be cleaning in between. Um, and we have separate areas in those classrooms for students to store their materials so they aren't having to share any materials or having access to what the previous student may have touched the day before. We are able to prioritize having double desks in our kinder, our, excuse me, our TK through first grade classrooms so that our very youngest students would not be sharing desks from day to day. They would each have their own A or B designation for that. On the right, you can see our plan for um, making sure that the bathrooms are used appropriately um, with uh, space for uh, students to use grade level designated bathrooms so that younger students are not mixing in bathrooms with older students, but also making sure that not too many people are in the bathroom at the same time. And again, um, similar to Redwood Shores Elementary School, we have a great team of teacher leaders who are continuing to plan through lo logistics of things like entry points, um, where students would be supervised before school, um, those kinds of situations so that we can make sure that there's social distancing throughout the day. All right, and with that, I will turn it to Ching Pei on the instructional design. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I know it's a little awkward for us to switch sharing screens when we're sharing the slides, but we thought it was easier to drive our, our own presentations. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our instructional design. It's gonna go pretty quickly because as our superintendent mentioned at the very beginning, we are starting the year off in full distance learning. 100% of our students will be receiving instruction online five days of the week. Um, we are in this fully dialed up stage where everyone has to be distanced because of our status on the state monitoring list. The governor has set up criteria and 
we have to follow the state laws that are written for us. Um, as the situation improves and evolves, we are hopeful that we are going to be able to come back to campus in a hybrid model at some point during the year. We all value the in-person interaction and instruction and feel like developmentally speaking, that is the best choice for students. Um, and when it is safe to do so, we will balance our, our responsibilities um, to give the best instructional experience with a safe health health and safety protocols. Um, and eventually, hopefully, we will be able to open back up fully in person, full time, kind of in a new normal. And I don't think normal will ever be the same, but at least we'll be able to have kids together. We are currently on the watch list, meaning that the metrics that Marie showed you earlier have us uh, flagged. Um, we, the county website has not been updated as the last time I checked, but the last time we looked, we had 114.8 cases per 100,000, and that puts us over the threshold. So we are going to talk to you a little bit about SB 98, which is Senate Bill 98. This is the educational trailer bill that puts into requirements, puts into law requirements to ensure consistency of quality and rigor for our students. I'm not gonna read to you um, what's on the slide. I hate when people do that to me, but I want you to note that there are new guidelines and requirements for teachers and for school districts to ensure that there is a consistency of experience across the district for all students, as we know that distance learning is, is hard on families and students. Um, a few of the key factors here that really are going to be pertinent for you, you will see live daily instruction. This means a two-way interaction between teachers and parents teachers and students. There might still be some asynchronous learning where a teacher will make a recording of him or herself or direct a child to go to an online resource and do some independent learning, but there will also be live daily interaction where the students are asking questions, getting immediate feedback, and participating in instruction. In the spring, you'll remember that attendance was not mandatory. All of our um, Funding is based off of daily attendance rates, and we were give, granted a little bit of a reprieve as everyone figured out what was going on and what was up and down. Starting on August 19th, when we report back to school, attendance is going to be taken on a daily basis by your classroom teacher. We are going to be monitoring attendance um, and chronic absenteeism, just like we did prior to COVID-19. There are required instructional minutes at each grade level, so it's three hours for kindergarten and between 230 and 240 minutes for the other grade levels. So ultimately four hours, um, three hours and 50 minutes for a couple of grade levels and four hours for the rest. We will continue to provide services for our students with special education needs. One of the, um, I think the, the three on the bottom are, are the piece that, that's gonna feel new to you. We are responsible for working and ensuring kids are not disengaged. So that means regularly monitoring what they complete in terms of their time during synchronous learning, as well as what is completed and turned in during asynchronous learning with regular reporting back to families on student progress. Um, and then the state requires of us, and it's not something we wouldn't do without the requirement, but we are working on ensuring connectivity. So uh, providing families with support for Wi-Fi access as well as the hardware. Um, we are prepared with hardware to loan to families who need or want to borrow from us, um, and we are working on connectivity issues. As we speak, we, there, there are some new news that came out from the state today, so we're going to work with our private um, partnerships to procure, procure support. Something that we want to put out there, just to make sure everybody understands the difference between synchronous learning and asynchronous learning, when we use these terms, we want to make sure everyone is on the same page. So, Throughout the instructional day, your student will experience both modalities. Synchronous learning is when, whether we're in the same physical location or virtual location, your teacher and your student are experiencing together at the same time. Um, this will be a predictable schedule that is posted through a communications platform, and I'll get to that in a little bit later slide, but there's gonna be a consistent place where you can see what your child's schedule is and where the Zoom links or Google Meet links are going to be. There will be conferring between teachers and students and feedback, and it could be large group where all 30 students are online with the teacher, or it could be a combination
combination of small groups or even individual time. This is similar to what happens in the classroom. A teacher typically will open the lesson and, and deliver a discrete 15 to 20 minute mini lesson to the whole class and then release students to work independently, during which time he or she will check in with a student or check in with a group of students or, or maybe even half the class that needs a little bit of either reteaching or acceleration. And during that time, kids are engaged in asynchronous learning, meaning that they are doing independent work and some of your students might work really quickly and in the you know 30 minutes allotted to do their work, they might finish in five minutes and find that they can go do extra challenge activities or take a break outside and, and, and run around the block and, and burn off some energy. But the idea is there will be both synchronous learning guided by the teacher, just like we're doing now. We're having, we're not having interaction <laughs> because um, we're, we're monitoring the chat, but it's not a two-way interaction, whereas your students would be participants in the full Zoom with their teacher. Um, and there will be asynchronous as well, where things are posted and you have some flexibility about when you might need to complete it, um, depending on your family schedule. A couple um, slide, a slide here with two tables that kind of lay out what spring distance learning looks like. Our teachers really worked hard. Um, but despite all of the energy and effort and care put into distance learning in the spring, we know that the experience across the district was varied um, and it was inconsistent. And so some people have been sending rave reviews and, and praising their teachers for all the wonderful work that went in. Um, and some of it was maybe less than positive. But ultimately, what I want to point out to you is that with SB 98, with the planning time that we've had, with the collaborative time that we've had, with the support that we're receiving from School Force, we're able to ensure a couple of different things for you. There will be a traditional grading and full report card for our students. SB 98 requires that we provide progress monitoring and assess students. So it won't be this one way assigning lessons and hoping kids do it, but assigning lessons, collecting and grading and providing feedback, and then providing the differentiated instruction you've grown accustomed to, the things that our teachers do when they're live and students are in person on campus. Um, we talked about how there are instructional minutes required by grade level band. There's going to be regular synchronous learning. It's not going to be a case of, did I get the short straw or the long straw? Every student will have interaction with their, with their teacher online. Um, we have also new, new requirements that state that we will be using our adopted curriculum. We have standards-based grade level appropriate rigorous curriculum that we've adopted that we use in our classrooms. During the spring, everything was put a little bit on hold because it was an emergency. We were shifting quickly. The, the, the reality is we are probably going to be in distance learning for a significant amount of time. We're going to prepare and plan for coming back in hybrid, but we also need to be mentally prepared that this distance learning model is going to stay for a little bit. And so it's really important that we utilize our good adopted curriculum and figure out how to teach it online rather than trying to find resources left and right and sending families on a goose hunt to all the different links. And yes, there's wonderful material available online, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have standards-based curriculum that we're good at teaching. So we're just gonna utilize our platforms and our materials and deliver strong instruction for your students. The other piece that made it really tricky to support teachers and ultimately families was the choice and the latitude and the variety of free resources made available to folks in March. We gave our staff professional latitude to choose, which is, I think, a, a good thing in the end, but it also means that there were several platforms chosen, making it difficult for families, making it difficult for us to centralize our support, making it difficult to organize coherent professional development, which is different. We've spent, we've, we've already sent out several different professional development opportunities over the summer focused specifically on distance learning, focused on using our tools like, like um, Google, the Google suite in the classroom. But we also have professional de development planned between now and the start of the school year, as well as ongoing professional development throughout the school year to continually support teachers in their work in learning how to teach in a different methodology. 
Here are some online platforms. Um, what I want to point out is that we have heard the feedback. We understand that it's difficult when you have children at multiple grade levels at multiple school sites to figure out where do I go? One teacher uses Seesaw, another uses School Open, another uses Classroom, and another uses still another platform that nobody's heard of before. So we are streaming Streamlining this. Students TK3 for the student and parent facing piece will go to Seesaw to get all of their communications. Everything will come through Seesaw. That's your one point of interaction for understanding what's going on and what the schedules look like. For our four or five classrooms, the Google Classroom is going to be the landing spot. And for uh, six, eight at Sandpiper, it's also going to be Google Classroom. We have School Loop used at Ralston, but for our Sandpipers families here tonight, it's going to be Google Classroom. For our learning management system, this is the teacher facing piece where they're collecting information, where they're housing everything it's turned in, that gets turned in, um, keeping grades, giving feedback. Our TK2 teachers will be utilizing Seesaw primarily. Of course, they might be using Google Classroom as well, and that's fine, that's teacher facing, so that doesn't affect your interaction at all. Um, and then for our three through eight, third through eighth grade teachers, they will be using our Google Classroom slash Illuminate integration. So um, some of you with older kids have already experienced the Illuminate Parent Portal where you can see how kids are doing on tests. And some of your teachers are leading edge teachers and have already used the gradebook. There is a strong integration. So teachers will have the option to use the Illuminate gradebook and post information so that families can independently see on the Parent Portal all that's happening. And then you'll see that there is a bunch of su supplemental support. The thing that families are familiar with is the single sign on to Clever. This is where all of our adopted curriculum resides kind of in the cloud. So you forgot your, you know, this isn't gonna be an issue, but uh, traditionally you forgot your social studies textbook at school, but you need it for homework at home, then you're a seventh grader and you need to read something, it's available on Clever. We are going to handle the materials distribution, figure out all of those logistics for you between now and the start of school, but just know you will have the hardbound book, but you also have the online access. So if you wanna look for a specific something, you can do it through Clever. This is also where those of you who have been with our district for a while are familiar with. You access Lexia, you access Raz Kids. All of the supplemental instructional tools for the students will be available on Clever. And we can put links to it from Seesaw. So as a parent, you only have to interact with Seesaw. Um, and then we are buying both content support and instructional tool support for our teachers. Um, Nearpod, Screencastify, these are ways to help make online lessons a little bit more interactive. The reality of it is we still present slides because I, it, my husband worked for Microsoft for many, many years and was on the PowerPoint team. And so it feels a little bit dated. However, showing the visual while you're teaching helps kids see what's happening. Um, it gives them some schema to hook into. And if we can make it more interactive, then we can ensure that we're not just looking at kids staring at a screen, not really sure where they're at, but with Nearpod, you can put in polls, you can put in games. So as you get to um, a more interactive part, you can say, everybody type in your, or click and play the game, and you can monitor who's paying attention, who's interacting, who's actually there. So as, as the teacher, you can say, you know, Dan, I see that you're not clicking. Are you on another tab? Come on back, please. So these are tools to not only make the instruction more engaging for the students, but also to help our teachers manage this new world of online instruction. Um, our K2 students are going to have a new phonics supplement from Super Kids. The teachers are ecstatic to be receiving those materials. For K2 parents, you'll see that you'll have consumables. There will be decodables that your kids will be working on. Um, we are also purchasing new Zella and Gizmos. So we have social studies and science support for the older students. We have a multitude of online texts. The teachers will have access to Epic Books, which is filled with such a diversity of text. So if you're not tapped into your library, your library and uh, borrowing ebooks, it's okay because the teachers will be able to help your students who hopefully are voracious readers and certainly at you know, TKK12 when the decodables are three pages long, kids go through <laughs> tens, 20, 30, hundreds of books a week. Um, we'll be able to capitalize on Epic Books to help support and not have to worry about what does the distribution look like? Do I go to school to get another book bag? We won't need to do that. And then all of our teachers are getting 
additional support for their virtual lessons for the reading and writing workshop units of study. Um, for distance learning, again, this is a text heavy slide. We just wanted to put it out here and memorialize for you what you can expect. I'm just gonna talk to a couple of the points. We want to clarify that distance learning is characterized by your teacher and your student being in two different physical locations, but that does not mean that there is no interaction. It, um, we did our admin retreat this week with Zoom and I, you're always nervous because it's a little bit different, but I have to say, I think our team of administrators, even though half of us are new, felt well connected and were able to engage and had the opportunity to have two-way interaction. So we can do this for the kids. We're gonna have to learn how, and we're going to have to support our teachers who are a little bit more um, hesitant and, and maybe need a little bit more tech savvy, but that's what we're here for. It's our job to support our teachers to make sure they're supporting their students. What they know how to do is relate to students and teach students, and we're gonna help them with the technical aspects. Um, I do wanna point out too that, I just wanna remind folks that if, whatever schedule is decided upon, whatever schedule we end up working out, your student will not be in front of a screen for the entirety of the instructional day. It will be a balance of synchronous learning where they're going to be on a Zoom or a Meet, um, a Google Meet with their teacher, and also asynchronous time where they can turn the camera off, they can disconnect for a little bit, and you can help them set a timer to say, we're gonna come back in 25 minutes. There's going to be workbooks that we've ordered. So even if, even if you can access everything on Clever and do it digitally, there are gonna be times when you're going to choose to actually use the hard copy workbook that you have because you don't want your child staring at the screen and that's perfectly fine. That's part of the reason we, adopt, we are adopting Seesaw in the primary grades. As a tool, it is really easy to take a picture and upload so that kids are still developing their fine motor skills and their OT uh, needs with a paper and a pencil. And it's not just going to be typing it in front of a screen. Here is a sample schedule. We are working through this with our teachers union and we are working on all the kinks and the details. I think the key takeaway from this is there will be a consistent schedule for your family. There will be a consistent place by grade level for where you as a parent will go to support your child in terms of figuring out what does the schedule look like? Where do I get the information? Where is my teacher communicating with me? And there will be a consistent schedule Monday through Friday of when are the breaks? When is lunchtime? When are we logging in? When am I working independently? All of our TK through five students um, will receive PE from La Garza on a weekly basis. And all of our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students at Sandpiper are going to continue to receive PE instruction from Mr. Van Lahr. So none of that is changing. All of our uh, students are going to get their music instruction from the music specialist. So the third graders will get their weekly 30 minute lesson. The fourth and fifth graders will get their weekly 30 minute music lesson from the prep teacher. And they will also get to opt into instrumental music in fourth and fifth grade, just like we always have. And uh, Mr. Barnes and Dr. De La Pietra will work out those schedules. Sandpiper sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students will still have the opportunity to opt into instrumental, um, just like it has been in the past. We anticipate it will be outside of the traditional school day, so it could be before school or after school, and this is because it is taught by teachers who are working full-time and teaching uh, students across all, set, all six of our sites. Um, and then, of course, your fourth and fifth graders will still continue to receive their two hours of weekly instruction from your science specialist. Um, so this is a sample, the one, you know, the takeaways I've already noted. The other thing to note is on Wednesdays, we will continue to have a minimum day. There will be four hours of instruction um, as the law requires for all of the grade levels, um, three hours in kindergarten, and then we'll end the day and your teachers will use the afternoon like they always have in professional development, in staff meetings, in collaboration time. So we are balancing the need to not have kids in front of the screen all day long, because we know that's not good for our mental health, it's not good for our eyesight, um, with a need for our teachers to have additional pre preparation time and planning time to make sure the time that they do have with your kids is really awesome and well-designed. Oh, I, I sh sorry. I'm gonna unhide, because I accidentally hit a slide that I don't want to hide. the beauty of online.
Okay, so middle school. Middle school at uh, Sandpiper tends to be blocks and not periods, but we can look at it in either way, whether you, um, we're, we're going to come up with a consistent schedule. So your math and science teacher will teach math and science. Your English language arts and history social science teacher will still teach that. You will have an elective and PE. So in looking at the day, even though period one and three might be taught by the same teacher and together, we wanted to break it up so that you could see that we're talking English language arts, math, social studies, science, PE, elective. This way there's a visual of how the day is going and how you'll work through. It will be predictable and it will be scheduled. You're probably wondering, okay, so I know what my teachers are doing. My teachers are going to be interacting with my student, my child. What about all the other people that are on campus? We have a lot of people who uh, support your students throughout the day. So we've listed in this table the common person, uh, common roles that you'll see at each of your school sites. Um, I want to point out that we do still have one life counseling that will support our TK through five classrooms. And then there is a part-time counselor at Sandpiper shared between Sandpiper and Nesbitt that will work specifically with our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. So one of the things you'll see is they're not going to teach the second step lesson like they did in previous years, but they will be offering weekly time with your classroom teacher to complement the social emotional development. We need to support our kids holistically. It's, it's not just going to be academics. We do have a plan for making sure kids don't fall behind. We do have a plan for assessing and ensuring that instruction continues at a good pace. But we also have a plan to make sure that your whole child is supported. It's not just the reading, writing, and arithmetic. We are going to support our students and spend, spend a lot of time teaching them uh, resiliency skills and just helping them feel connected again to peers because the social connection that was missing in the spring is is detrimental and we we want to make sure we are we are accounting for that and we want to make sure there's ample opportunity to teach our students how to connect with one another but you'll see again a text heavy slide that I'm not going to read everything to you but ultimately we have a plan for all of all of our staff all of our staff are returning. We have not performed layoffs. We want you to feel comfortable and confident to know that if your child had speech and language pathology services and learning center specialists and also OT, those services are still going to be provided just in a remote setting, um, not in person. If your child wants to see a counselor, they don't have to have an IEP. They don't need to have something severely out of control, a counselor is available on site to support all of our students because every one of us from time to time needs someone to talk to. So I just want to put out there that we have a, a slew of services and supports available to our students. A lot of families have been uh, reaching out and asking what can they do at home? How can we ensure this partnership works? Because ultimately, yes, our teachers are going to be engaging in your students. There's going to be a consistency of schedule. You can rely on the instructional uh, support from the classroom and not from needing to hire a tutor or finding some outside source. Our teachers are expert teachers. They are going to teach your students. We have full confidence in that. But this is still a partnership. Your kids are going to be at home with you um, during the day. So there are a couple of things, right? It's important that your children have a, a consistent place to work. It doesn't have to be their own beautiful fancy desk in their own room hidden away from the world, but it should be a place where they can focus, where if you have two kids at home who need to be online at the same time, maybe they have headphones so that they don't hear the interaction from someone else. I'm sorry, you need to glass your dad. I'm mom duty. Um, so having that consistent place is going to be important. I think even though your teachers are going to be following a schedule, it's important for us to check in. Did you look up, log on to Seesaw today? Do you know what your plan is for the morning? Just to make sure we're keeping connected with our students in the school. We want to make sure that outside of the school day, we as a, we as a family have a routine. Um, I know in my household, bedtime has slowly crept later and later and later. And this morning, I had no children awake at 10 a.m., which is a shocker. I'm looking forward for school to start in a couple of weeks so we can get back onto a bedtime routine and a wake-up routine. Um, we want to make sure we give our kids time to process all that's going on. This is hard. This is difficult. And maybe they don't know any better or we think they don't know any better. 
but they miss their friends. And we, we as a school and as a community need to support our students through it. Cause I know as a mom, I need a break for my family <laughs> as much as they need a break for me. Um, so we just need time to process. I think it's really important to take advantage of the beautiful natural environment that we have around us. We're lucky to be in California where the weather is good and we can go outside and there aren't bugs. Um, but getting that physical exercise is gonna support the social emotional health of, health of our students as well. We have the opportunity to stay connected through things like FaceTime, through Google, through Zoom. I can't imagine 20 years ago how we would have stayed in touch with our family and friends because we didn't have video conferencing tools kind of at the easy grasp. Um, that being said, also, if you have a social bubble, it's important that you, you take advantage of that and create a bubble of people that you feel safe and sound with, because then your students can continue to maintain social relationships and develop socially, which is so key to their developmental needs um, in this young adolescent age. And finally, we are going to teach your students the skills they need to be successful online through video conferencing, but it is a partnership. And so I put this last bit about being a good digital citizenship. Together, we can make sure your students know that when they're on in class, their camera should be on. They should be paying attention to their teacher. They shouldn't be toggling between their game and, and, and their screen, um, that there's a time for play and a time for, for focus. Um, that you know, social media is for kids who are older than our students and, and things that go online are permanent. There's lots of lessons that will be taught. I think it's really important. Um, I think it's also important for families to know that when your student is on, on Zoom, there's a potential that they're gonna see someone's sibling walking by or someone's dog or someone's dad. So in, in, in that respect, the classroom's a little bit different and we're all gonna follow and be respectful, but it is something that we together need to help work out. Um, so that's the instructional model. Um, I think we covered most of the pieces. I'm sorry, I was not able to scan the chat and I know there are lots of questions that came and we'll, we'll look through those. I'm gonna hand it over to Dan, who's gonna talk a little bit about next steps. Great, uh, thanks, Ching Pei. Will you, uh, next slide, please? Uh, one slide before, there we go. All right, uh, I will keep it short because I, we do wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Uh, so we get a, a lot of questions about transitioning off of the watch list and into the hybrid model. Um, once uh, we're released from the watch list, we have 14 days of required time to be off of the watch list until we can transition back into the hybrid model. Uh, realistically speaking, um, it will take um, significantly more planning time than that 14 days. We anticipate uh, by the time we do our surveys, it will take roughly five to, five to six weeks or so. Um, we will be putting out a new survey. Uh, we will make sure that we're getting parents' um, feelings about the transition back uh, when it comes just in time. And um, make that shift um, accordingly. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, some of the feedback we got when we were doing the initial survey was, was kind of questions about transitioning in and transitioning out and, and how come we aren't able to necessarily guarantee people that entry and exit point um, all along the way. This, the schedule gets pretty complex um, I think actually this point of starting in distance and transitioning into the hybrid uh, gives us all a little bit more planning time. But in terms of, of thinking, we have to make sure that we have class size ratios uh, with our teachers uh, to make sure class size ratios during those transitions are maintained. Uh, and there needs to be an appropriate balance. Uh, we have to make sure that, um, or at least consider what happens uh, when preferences change and we're not necessarily able to accommodate the same schedule, you know, that could require a change in teachers. Another question that I've had about teachers under the full distance learning model, 100%. Again, 100% is not an AB schedule. It's five days a week. I want to just keep reiterating that. Um, uh, your, your children will be with your uh, assigned teachers at your school sites. Uh, so all students will be, be attending uh, just like they would if we were in person, but we're virtual uh, for these first few weeks. Um, the other thing that we look at is, is as we're transitioning cohorts, making sure that we're able to keep uh, cohort exposures, we're able to put into place contact tracing, 
so that if somebody does get sick, uh, we're able to uh, trace that accordingly and make the appropriate um, shifts. Um, so with that, I, I wanna also address two other things before I, I turn it over back to our panel and Pam for questions. Um, one is a copy of the presentation was put in the chat, uh, but will also be on our website uh, with this recording. Um, two is I've had a lot of questions about the waiver. Uh, there is a waiver process to come off of the watch list and, and offer hybrid instruction. Uh, full disclosure, the parameters for that waiver was just released on Monday night. So there's a lot of information still to sift through on the waiver process. Uh, we need to seek input um, from our stakeholders across the board. We need to make sure that um, testing for staff um, is in place before we, we can consider moving forward. And, and likely um, uh, that process is, is designed to bring um, vulnerable groups onto campus. Um, and that's what we would start at uh, looking at first. Um, and then finally, I just want to acknowledge um, as we transition, um, I'm a parent of two elementary age boys myself, so I also um, understand the dynamic uh, that we're all in. We've been working really close with our child care uh, partners uh, in district uh, to look at space, to look at options, to support them. Uh, know that those conversations are continuing to evolve and we'll share resources um, as they share them with us, uh, with you. And um, with that, I know a panel has been monitoring chat. Um, if anybody wants to jump in while Pam uh, pulls out some questions that we may have missed. A couple of questions that I've seen. Uh, when we talk about vulnerable students, we're talking about our most vulnerable learners, those who are not able to um, engage in a remote setting. So most likely thinking about our students with, with severe special education needs. Um, those would be the, the first batch of kids we would look at bringing back. The other thing that keeps coming up um, is, do we expect our teach students to be able to be independent with their students? I, from, from our perspective, your teacher should be guiding your student during the instructional day. So while they're not going to be in, online the whole time, and it's going to be a balance of being online and then asynchronous and synchronous, I would fully expect our teachers to say, during the asynchronous time, you have 45 minutes, you have an hour, whatever they designate, here are your tasks to do during that time. And I will follow up with you when we log back in. That's the type of expectation that we're thinking so that those of you who are working from home are present and your kids are, 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 are taken care of, but we don't, we're, we are hoping and we're planning for you to not have to be the teacher who says, oh wait, you have an hour, what are you supposed to do? Let's figure this out. Let's pick and choose for ourselves. Um, as we had said earlier, your teachers are expert teachers. They know how to guide students and we're gonna help them with the technical aspect of how to do it from a remote setting. But we do fully anticipate the teacher is going to take the driver's seat. Okay, Great. so uh, are you ready, Dan? <laughs> uh, so I you know we've all been, we, so we've all been seeing uh, the chat as they've been coming along. Uh, Gloria, can you answer some of the uh, logistical site-based questions? Absolutely, my pleasure to. Thank you very much, um, Sandpiper families and other families who are here tonight asking great questions. Um, I saw a few come through that were specific to Sandpiper. One was related to accelerated math. Is it still the plan for the middle school to address accelerated math um, at Sandpiper? Yes, and um, we know that we have work to do related to prioritizing standards so that students will be able to um, get as much of the year worth of standards as we can do. Um, and we are planning our schedules around that so that we can maximize time for core um, instruction so that we can maximize those kinds of um, standards and those experiences for students. Um, related to that, I also saw a question about Genius Hour. It's a very important part of um, what Sandpiper does for our students and with our students. It was very important to the teachers that we maintain some Genius Hour opportunities. And so we are planning for that in our schedule on Wednesdays. Um, and along with that, we are planning opportunities for advisory or small group instruction that's supported um, with our PE teacher, Mr. Van Lahr, so that when some students are in PE, some students are also getting opportunities for small group instruction advisory type check-ins with their homeroom teachers. So we are making those plans um, as we speak and we'll get those schedules out to you as soon as we can. Um, I also noticed a question, not necessarily related to Sandpiper, but um, how it will look at Sandpiper 
I wanted to address that. And that's about whether or not students will be able to eat lunch with their siblings. Um, in order to maintain physical distance at lunchtime, um, we really will have to um, uh, separate and have staggered lunch time. So I cannot guarantee that siblings would be able to eat together um, if, if we are and when we are in a hybrid situation. As much as I would love to prioritize that, I think our bigger priority is around um, safety and physical distancing during lunchtime. Okay, Thank so, you. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Gary. <laughs> sorry, Pam, I was gonna chime in a little bit about some general questions regarding school supplies and class lists. Um, so the first is school supplies. Uh, I know for Redwood Shores Elementary School, the teachers and I worked collaboratively with our PTA to support a list for, of school supplies. And I know that Sam Piper did something similar. So those are all being ordered and taken care of. So I just had a meeting today with a group of staff uh, talking through how we're gonna manage those uh, school supplies and getting those materials to students. Uh, as well, we have curriculum materials that we'll need to get out to students as as well. So yes, some students love to have their special trapper keeper like I had in 1986 or something. Um, but, uh, but you know, we, we will and be prepared to provide composition books like this one um, and other materials for students to access their education um, as well. Um, and, and so we'll be working on those logistics uh, right at the beginning of the school year um, as well. Uh, class lists. So teachers and I uh, work collaboratively to make class lists in the spring. Teachers put a lot of time into making class lists and it's very important to them that we make a um, uh, diverse and uh, robust class list program. So when they left in June, those were ready, um, they, but they were just very much drafts. So those drafts are still in place and we will build from those drafts with new enrollment information um, and new feedback from teachers and from myself and from families that we have been gathering over the course of the summer. So, um, and then the BRSSD, Qingpei and others can, dis can perhaps provide insight on when those lists will be available. But last year they were available right before school started. So I'll let Qingpei answer that specific. Thank you. We, we plan to continue with the same uh, posting a couple of days prior to the start of the school year. If, if those of you uh, who have our returning parents remember, we have you go through and verify all of your emergency information prior um, and you get your class list kind of as a thank you for the emergency information because we need to be able to reach you in case of an emergency. Um, so that will still, that's still planned for a couple of days right before school starts, just to give us the opportunity to make sure our rosters are all set and correct in the system before we push that out. The worst thing is to get a list and think that, oh, I'm so lucky I have Mrs. Amsler, but then two days later realize, whoops, there was a glitch and she's not going to be my teacher. Um, so we will plan for that. Um, since I have the mic again, we are going with our full plan of five days a week, which means the scope and sequence is slightly changed because it's still ver remote versus in person, but our teacher leaders have been hard at work all summer long coming up with what makes sense to do remotely, what makes sense to do in person for our hybrid model. And thankfully, because we are able to meet with our students three to four hours every single day, we'll be able to cover most of our standard curriculum, but we are identifying the key standards and skills. So maybe they won't have the exact same experiment as their older student, as their older sibling got. Maybe they won't do the exact same project that was done when uh, in-person school happens, but your children will leave their grade level with the necessary skills to matriculate to the next grade level. We have full confidence our teachers can do that. I'm seeing the twins question, Qingbei. The one difference in placement is um, because at some point we are hoping to transition back, we want to, we are going to keep twins together with the same teacher this year. This is a little bit of a change in practice. In, in the past, we have tried to separate twins to give them a little break from each other. They're already home together all day. But given that we are fully remote, um, we thought it was easiest for families to follow the same schedule, have the same teacher, have the same assignments. And then when we are coming back to hybrid, having the kids in the same, co same, same group of kids means that we have one less family to contact trace. Um, if and when it's safe to come back in hybrid, we can certainly talk about putting one twin in an A group and one twin in a B group so that there are opposite schedules and therefore have some independence away from their sibling. But at least then their cohort of 25 kids that they have 
you know, that their vector score is consistent and we're not exposing a family to a, additional folks unnecessarily. Okay, Pam, as you've been looking through chat, uh, any other questions that you can uh, share with us that have, have percolated consistently? Uh, the one question that I do see, and we might have touched on it a little bit, but still getting more questions about is how much parent engagement is involved for smaller kids, particularly in kindergarten. Do the kids, parents need to be, you know, keeping the child focused and with them at all times? I think this is going to be a little bit of a partnership and at the very beginning of the year as we're trying to get our youngest learners into the routine it's it's probable that families are going to need to provide a little bit more support to their young learners it is also dependent on your personal situation right i would say when my daughter was a five-year-old she could have done it completely independently and did not need me but my son is a fifth grader still needs me to check in. So it's going to be a little bit of a balance. I, I do think that we are expecting that our teachers will take the lead and teach our kids the skills and, and practice and reinforce, um, but we can't do this alone. And, and I think we'd be naive to think that we can let our kids go to their room and turn on their device and be completely engaged from 8.30 to 2.30 without help. Um, that being said, I also know that requiring a parent to sit next to your child for the entire time is also not feasible. So we're going to work and, and I would say keep in communications with your teacher about what your child is able to handle and not able to handle just like when we're in person. Um, one other question that does come up quite a bit is what about parents Olivia. that don't have um, uh, the flexibility to work from home and have to be out of the house um, and also essential workers? Um, yes. Uh, so I'll just say, I, again, I, I um, totally understand from a parent's perspective. I, I am in that, we are all in that situation together. Um, we, we, we remain committed to working again with our child care providers. Um, I don't know that there is an easy solution to this. Um, we, we hear that some families are trying to partner um, with each other. Um, that in and of itself does, does bring other concerns and, and the, the other cohorts and pods, but we know uh, families are turning to that as a potential solution. Um, as I was working with um, our leadership team the last two days, the theme of our, our work has been better together. And um, really that serves us all, you know, parents, educators, leaders, um, we're all in this together. And the more we can support each other, uh, the better off we are. I would probably encourage you, um, if you're looking at trying to set up some of those little internal pods or whatnot, um, reach outside of who you might normally go to, uh, venture out and, and get to know the other uh, kiddos, families in your, in your class. Um, and, and again, um, together we are stronger and it's not easy for any of us. Um, but we, we are in it together for sure. Um, one other question that I've seen is, uh, will students have the same teacher for the entire year? We always um, recognize that that consistency is ideal, right? And we want our, our students uh, to bond with our teachers and our teachers to bond with our students. Uh, if uh, our models are consistent, um, absolutely. If we need to change um, from uh, distance learning to hybrid, uh, there is the possibility that, that teachers could change. Um, just like we want to accommodate families, um, we also want to be able to accommodate our teacher preferences and, and allow for some flexibility and some options uh, for both. That's the ideal situation. In a perfect world, that would be a perfect match um, and we'd be able to accommodate that. Um, uh, that's likely not the case. So yes, there could be uh, the need to shift. Um, I have heard from, from our community that uh, the ability to go back and forth um, uh, is, is an important piece um, and that, that changes uh, likely could be um, uh, worked out. 
but um, it's a sensitive area for sure. We'll do our best. Um, Dan, one other question that is coming up is, will students, um, will the lessons be available uh, for uh, access in the evening for parents and students that don't have uh, the ability to be able to be at home and doing it during the day? I'll defer to you, Jingpei, on that one. We are planning, so one of the pieces that is different this spring, it, different from the spring, is that attendance is mandatory. So we do need to, we're, we will make sure students who are not able to attend during the day will still have the opportunity to do their work and turn in their work and get their attendance counted. We have to work out those specifics with the teachers. I would say if you are a family finding yourself unable to have your child attend during the day for whatever reason it is, please do reach out to us so we can support you um, and, and we can ensure that your teacher is supporting you and that you are not left on your own. Thank you. So Pam, I see we are getting to our time. I know we've been able to go uh, through a, a good majority of the questions as we've been talking. Uh, is there one more that has percolated to the top for us? Um, at the beginning, there were some questions about technology and um, will they students need Chromebooks and um, how will the parents receive the information, new parents receive information for access to the portals and logins and all of that? So you are always welcome to use your own personal device. You're always welcome to buy a device because I know some of us are a little bit particular, especially if you have a spouse who works in tech like mine. Um, but if you need support or you <laughs> simply just don't have three laptops for three kids, because you know that's totally understandable, we as a school district will provide for you. We are working out the logistics of figuring out how, how do we figure out who needs what at this point for a distribution along with your textbooks. Um, so we will, we will ensure that you have access to technology, but if you have, any, anything is going to work. If you have a laptop, if you have a Chromebook, if you have an iPad, 99% of our, our platforms are web-based. Um, so you will be able to access with anything, even a smartphone. Um, that's a tech piece. What was the second part? Uh, access to portals and setting up uh, for new people to the district. We will send the information with the start of the school. Um, most of the information will come through your classroom teacher because your students will have their single sign-on and they will be able to access their everything using that one sign-on. In terms of the Illuminate Parent Portal, Jerome and I handle the notification. For those of you who already have your portal signed up, you're set to go. You don't have to re-register just because it's a new year. You set up your own personal email and password. Um, if you have troubles with it, you can reach out to me. I do a lot of resetting. Don't, don't feel bad reaching out. Um, and we will, or you could just wait because what will happen is once we're started and once we have everyone in classrooms, Jerome and I will do a mass merge and send out your access code and information for the Illuminate Parent Portal. Um, that's the only place really that you need to have a password and that's going to show you your report cards and your state testing results from the past years. Um, one family asked, as of now, the state has not canceled state testing for the 2021 school year. We are anticipating taking CASP. We will obviously have to figure out how do we do secure browsers and all of that. But for now, we should mentally prepare for a regular school year with report cards, uh, tests, lessons, um, interaction with peers, even if it's remotely, and ending the year with state testing. Great. Uh, so real quick, as, as we wrap it up, I do, I, I saw one more, I'll address one more. Uh, there were some questions about the way, uh, the timelines in terms of transitioning from uh, full distance to, to in-person. Uh, why why um, six weeks or so? Uh, simply the fact of two weeks to come off of the list. Um, we learned through our survey that it does take our families um, some time to complete the survey. Um, as well as kind of evaluate the conditions uh, that their uh, children will be stepping into. So um, allowing that survey time, it also takes us time, um, at least a week to two weeks to schedule and make sure we can have all those logistics uh, take place. And then also uh, teacher preparation 
in terms of making that transition happen. So honestly, six weeks is probably a pretty aggressive timeline already, but we will absolutely um, do our best. Uh, finally, I just, as we're wrapping up tonight, I just wanna thank all of our families for joining us. I also wanna uh, do a very special thank you to uh, School Force. Uh, School Force has been instrumental in so many ways in BRSSD. Um, and they've really come to the support uh, of us in, in terms of distance learning with, with platforms and support for uh, the technology uh, aids, as well as some of the PE support. So we definitely all appreciate uh, your generosity from the community to make uh, Salesforce, uh, or School Force, excuse me, School okay. Force uh, a, a tremendous uh, success. And, and with that, I just uh, wanna thank our panelists uh, for joining us tonight. Again, a big thank you to our community. Um, feel free as questions come up, um, email us, and this won't be the last time you hear from us. Um, our principals are all back in session uh, now and uh, they're responsive, they're available. Um, big smile, I see Carrie there. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to the 21, 2021 school year uh, and getting it started. Uh, we'll see you all soon and talk sooner. Um, have a great evening.